get started now. So good, off good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And Happy New Year. I wish you all a wonderful and um, healthy 2022. So without further ado, uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce our uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Tim Essenton. Uh, Tim is the uh, Lowell um, A. Uh, Wickfield Endowed Professor in Ocean and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington's uh, School of Aquatic and Fishery Science. Tim's works and publications actually have influenced a lot of my works uh, over the years. And uh, particularly his work uh, focuses on the food web interactions involving fish in um, marine, freshwater habitats and other habitats and uh, more recently look at fishery policy tools and the conservation benefits they provide. Uh, so these intersect with, with, with a lot of my work as well as uh, a lot of my colleagues' work uh, in the IOF as well. Um, of particular interest um, that he has is the applications of ecosystem approaches to fisheries management as applied to fisheries targeting small forage fish, a species that play important roles in the food web. And uh, I got to meet him in various meetings before, um, and it's really good to see him again uh, in our seminar today. And um, so from 20, 20, uh, 2013 and 2021, he was the director of the Center for Quantitative Science and the Quantitative Ecology and Resource Management Graduate Program. He's also the author of uh, uh, um, a book, um, The Introduction to uh, Quantitative Ecology, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a <laughs> mathematics and statistical ecology for beginners. Highly recommend uh, for those uh, uh, to, to, to read it. And, uh, and Tim received his PhD in zoology from the University of Wisconsin Madison. So uh, welcome, Tim, and uh, please uh, uh, take the floor um, for your seminar. Thanks very much. Thank you, Will. Um, uh... I should mention, I'm not going to share my screen. I'm just going to uh, uh, do this little projection thing. So uh, just you can make my video big, I think, by pinning it. And it should should appear large. Um, that way, it's a little bit more interactive. Um, um, thanks so much for the invitation. And I so, so wish, of course, that we're meeting in person um, to catch up with old friends and, of course, to uh, meet new ones. I always enjoy my visits up to UBC. So um, hopefully this will maybe spark some virtual conversations and um, sort of go that way. Um, what I want to talk about today is kind of a departure from some of the other things that I've talked about uh, when I've when I've visited. I've you know, given presentations on, on sort of global fishery stuff, but today I'm going to kind of talk more closer to my sort of ecological roots, uh, which is um, which is trained as an ecologist and I've always been really really interested in sort of systemic responses to environmental perturbations. Um, and it's sort of that theme of research I, I want to talk about today. And uh, it's going to focus on <clears throat> this idea of ecological forecasts, which, you know, I think this crowd is, is probably well aware. It's, it's uh, something we, it's an imperative. We need to be doing this uh, given the, the, you know, the rapid pace and magnitude of global change. And of course, Folks uh, uh, at your school have really been pioneers in, in really advancing methodologies and uh, really pushing the boundaries. So we have to be doing it. Um, uh, what I want to talk about is one one subset of that, which is thinking about how does the, what is the role of oxygen in in the role of in, in ecological forecasting and in climate change. And the 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 quick quick reason why this is relevant is we certainly expect that future oceans are going to have less oxygen in them. And in fact, we already see the signal now. We're, we're seeing oxygen minimum zones are getting larger. The, the frequency and intensity of low dissolved oxygen events are, be, are, are growing. Um, and then the, the simple physics tell us that as the atmosphere warms and the ocean warms, we're gonna see a lot less oxygen in the water. And the, the, the mechanisms are pretty straightforward. Uh, one, warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen, so that's an easy one. Uh, and then second, as it warms, we're going to get stronger stratification at the top of the water, uh, which uh, makes, makes it harder for that deeper water to replenish the oxygen supplies. Sprinkle in on top of that things like the Gulf of Mexico, where the Mississippi River is draining huge agricultural watersheds, bringing in all these nitrogen, causing 
productivity blooms and low dissolved oxygen, uh, all that's going to continue to happen. So a big piece of the forecasting, you know, in addition to thinking about some of the effects of temperature, is thinking about what are additionally the roles of oxygen, and then how does that interact with temperature as well. So I'm going to tell a, a series of, of short vignettes to kind of uh, talk about um, three instances of me kind of dipping my toe and sort of looking at some of the empirical evidence about uh, what are the ecological consequences of low dissolved oxygen. And the, the theme that's going to come through all of these is um, in almost all of those, I was really wrong from the outset <laughs> and then learned a lot by trying to like sort of muddle through. Um, and, and I think through that, I've learned a lot about thinking about ecological forecasting, sort of the appropriate degree of humility in ecological forecasting and the types of things that we can do to make our, our forecasts uh, uh, improve through time. So it's gonna start way back here in 2016. This is the front page of our, uh, what used to be one of our newspapers. Um, and and you know, whenever a fish ends up on the front page of a paper, people like me get really excited. Although this is really sad because what's happening here is uh, a diver is holding up a, a dead uh, ling cod that basically suffocated in Hood Canal. Um, happened during an event where this really, really low oxygen water that was at the bottom suddenly upwelled to the top. And then there was this really large fish kill. Um, so there was a lot of just dead fish washing up, divers finding dead fish. And obviously, rang understandably a lot of alarm bells. So um, I, I started just asking some simple questions about, oh, well, what's the consequence of having all these, these fish die in, in this case, uh, Hood Canal? So that's gonna be sort of the start of vignette number one. Um, the, 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 lead, the, the take home story from, from this little vignette, I always like to give the take home at the beginning if I can, is that while these are like very attention grabbing and certainly significant if you're that fish, um, you know, probably a better way to think about dissolved oxygen um, in, in dissolved e ecosystems is sort of more of like a metaphor would be like hypertension. It's something that's there in the background kind of doing damage uh, and you better be paying attention to it. And because hypoxia is, is imposing sublethal effects far more commonly and over longer periods of time, uh, in aggregate, most of the action when it comes to low dissolved oxygen actually is on the sublethal side. It's not the dramatic fish kills. It's all of the things that happen because oxygen is low and the responses of organisms. So uh, vignette number one is going to talk about um, this area here, um, Hood Canal. It's a branch of the um, inland waters of the Salish Sea in, in Washington. Um, so uh, yeah, there's Canada right there. So we got Canada on there. Um, the key thing about uh, Hook Canal, it's, it's a fjord. So it's naturally prone to having really low dissolved oxygen. And essentially, as you go further south in Hood Canal, the oxygen levels get worse and worse, uh, basically because there's a, there's a sill right about here that really prevents the exchange of deep water with the tides. So as a result, the residence time of water down here is quite high. Uh, it just means there's more time for oxygen to get depleted. Uh, the other key thing about Hood Canal uh, 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 reductions in oxygen is that it's seasonal. Um, so basically, if, if you were to go out there right now, uh, even down here where things are sort of at their worst, things are probably pretty fine because we've had plenty of storms uh, that have caused a lot of wind. It's allowed everything to mix. So things are, oxygen conditions are probably just fine right now. Uh, in fact, they'll stay fine until the summer, and then they'll slowly start to degrade through time as basically organisms start to consume the oxygen. So the, the worst time tends to be really late summer, early autumn, so, so September, October, and then eventually there'll be another storm and it'll mix again and the cycle sort of starts new. And there's this, so this is a system that just naturally does this all the time, and it, and it makes for an, a, a really good laboratory for an ecologist like me to go in and have, try to evaluate some of the consequences because you can get some really sharp gradients in the intensity and the timing of uh, oxygen reductions in order to parse out uh, causality from causality to oxygen as a part to other things. So we had a pretty extensive field program that had used a wide range of methods. We did a lot of um, bottom trawl surveys to get a sense of 
the demersal uh, of, uh, and, and benthic fauna, and, uh, looking at a bunch of you know, invertebrates that can't move a lot from fish that can move quite a bit. Uh, in addition to that, we did a lot of visual surveys, both with scuba divers. In this case, we were looking at uh, gooey ducks, uh, but also with drop cameras, looking at benthic communities, just to try to characterize differences in community structure, species who are most sensitive, least sensitive, et cetera. And I'm gonna do a very stylized <laughs> summary of kind of what we found. Um, and just to, just to remember, reminder, I kind of went into this with this mindset of like, oh, low dissolved oxygen kills things. That's the thing I'm really interested in. And what we found is for chronic species like this, the sea star right here, um, that's, that's probably the, the main thing. Um, so basically, if you were to go out into Hood Canal in June and uh, look at the density of, of sessile invertebrates, um, it would be quite a bit lower than uh, a comparative site, even though the oxygen at that time was about the same. Um, so presumably what this means is that uh, the, the fact that every season there's this period of time where oxygen gets really, really bad is having either through lethal effects or accumulation of sublethal effects, a dampening effect on population abundance. So it doesn't matter when you measure, they're just not there very much. And that included those really valuable things like gooey ducks, <clears throat> which have really great habitat down in Southern Hood Canal, but are just gone, which is not a surprise given the fact that, you know, they live to be hundred years old. So if they're gonna be subject to really low dissolved oxygen every three or four years. That's, that's a tough life history to pull off. Uh, in contrast, oops, skip the slide. Um, for any of the, the mobile taxa, if you go out in June, really wasn't much difference between Southern Hood Canal and more northerly regions. Uh, it was only during the period of time when hypoxia is low did you see a reduction, uh, which then just rang the bell that, oh, what's happening is all these mobile taxa are just leaving, uh, not surprisingly, to get out of the way of these adverse oxygen conditions. So these distributional effects, the sublethal response really dominated from uh, uh, the sort of more lethal effects. So it led us to think like, well, where, where's everything going? <laughs> are they uh, zipping up and down Hood Canal, getting out of Hood Canal entirely? Or are they just sort of moving up into the near shore environments to try to avoid the, the worst possible scenarios? Uh, we did this for a couple taxa, but the one that would turn to me most interesting was, was Dungeness Crab. Uh, what this shows is results of a bunch of telemetry work that we did in various regions in Hood Canal. And basically we just literally glued uh, an acoustic transponder on top of uh, a, a crab uh, shell after the their spring molting season. And these, these, plot, these are box plots of the average depth distribution of crabs uh, at a given week. And then in the background, it's not coming through great, but basically this red color here in the background basically corresponds to water quality. It's kind of lousy. Um, so quite low oxygen levels. I think it's below two milligrams per liter. Yellow is moderate, not so bad. And then blue is there's more oxygen than fish or crab could possibly need. Uh, so you can sort of look at the depth distribution relative to the water quality conditions. The northern regions, remember the part that gets a little bit more exchange with the ocean, uh, the really bad oxygen is really only at the bottom. Uh, the place where the crabs hang out, you're in this yellow zone and the fish really didn't, or the crabs didn't really change their vertical distribution at all. Um, but in the southern region that same year, you can see this red band starts expanding as the season goes on. And sure enough, the crabs are like, nope, I'm not going down there. Uh, and they basically just crawled up the sides of Hood Canal uh, into the shallows, uh, into quite shallow depths. Um, so, you know, normally these things are hanging out around 60 meters uh, and they were crawling up 30 meters, 15 meters, 20 meters. Even more interesting was in 2019, um, you can see the sort of red band actually came all the way up to the surface in, this was basically September, October. Um, and sure enough, the crabs did the same thing in 2019 as they're like, nope, I don't want to do that. And then when it came all the way up to the surface, they just left the area. Um, and then when it started to mix again, they came back and they came back and started to uh, use the whole depth. So pretty clear that these things are just 
taking advantage of the most immediate resource available to them, um, which in this case is potentially an issue because what these crabs are essentially doing is crawling into the area where the recreational crab fishery is most intense. Um, so all crabbing kind of happens in this band right here. Um, and that's exactly where the crabs are sort of going in. Um, and Holly Freilich in one of her dissertation chapters did a really nice management strategy evaluation in partnership with the tribes and the state managers asking, is the current management system robust to this? And she did some really nice work finding that it's probably okay if everyone follows the rules, but if people stop following the rules, the management system might be pretty vulnerable. So big take home lesson here, these sublethal effects are the most probably important one. Uh, animals leave the area, they move. So the question becomes, what's the consequence of those distributional shifts? I talked a little bit about that with the crabs. You could also imagine, hey, some of those distributional shifts might change your exposure to predators. Uh, it might put you in, in habitats that maybe have suboptimal temperatures. Maybe it doesn't have good prey availability. Um, all those things might happen. So uh, what we wanted to do then was sort of think a little bit more, from, particularly from a food web perspective, what might be sort of the consequences of species distributional shifts in the system. And we, we actually moved up in the water column to do this is rather than look at the benthic and demersal part of the food web, we focus on the pelagic part of the food web. And in particular, we zeroed in on one critical food web linkage in this system, and that's the food web linkage between a pelagic fish, which is principally herring and hake in the system, um, and their favorite, favorite food, which is really large adult uh, Euphausia pacifica, or I'll just say krill probably a few times. This is a, just an incredibly important link in the food web, primarily because uh, this comprises between 60 and 90% of the food that they eat is this one particular source. So they're really, really zeroed in on this one particular food item uh, for, for their growth. And then at the same time, these small pelagic fish are really important for a wide range of predators. You know, name your favorite piscivorous bird. They love to eat herring. They love to eat hake. Um, a lot of our marine mammals, so our pinnipeds in particular, uh, love to chow down on these things. And of course, our piscivorous fish, so that dead lingcod that I showed you, uh, probably before it passed away and enjoyed a lovely meal of Pacific herring at one point. And of course, our endangered salmon as well. So really, really important linkage. And by reviewing the historical ecological conditions in Hood Canal, looking at other systems that have looked at the sensitivity of these species to low dissolved oxygen. And just looking at our own past work, we pose some specific like, predictions about how this reduction in oxygen could affect this trophic interaction. And the, the basic idea looks something like this. This is a very stylized sort of view of vertical distributions of krill and fish in Hood Canal. And the whole idea is, um, let me play a little on my window here. Um, uh, so this is meant to illustrate depth and also light availability. So we're sort of thinking about visual predators that need to see stuff in order to eat. Um, so you got your fish that might hang out kind of in this zone right here. That's where there's enough light where it can see stuff, zoom in on it and gobble it down. Um, things like krill, especially during the daytime, they're gonna hang out on the bottom, try to get away from that, but some, they will hang out a little bit in this sort of shallower, well-lit zone. So this is sort of like the predation, vertical predation window where there's overlap between fish and krill uh, where predation is gonna happen. So then how does reduction in dissolved oxygen play into this? Well, let's imagine a scenario where there's sort of moderate oxygen depletion. So for uh, folks that maybe measure oxygen a lot, you know, oxygen around three to four milligrams per liter, somewhere in that zone. <clears throat> Plenty of sort of experimental work says that fish uh, are sort of more sensitive to that oxygen conditions than krill. Krill are pretty tough when it comes to oxygen. Uh, so we might expect if we were to impose a moderate level of oxygen depletion, so it maybe expands this part of the water column. Oops, I went too far. Oops, back up. Ah, here we go. Uh, and this level of the water column, uh, the fish are no longer going to dip down into this region right here anymore because they basically can't breathe. 
Uh, the krill are not going to change anything. And now that overlap box has completely disappeared. So we've uncoupled that really critical trophic linkage. But if the oxygen levels get worse, eventually you're going to get to the point where even the krill can't tolerate it. And then you get to that slide that I accidentally got to, which is this one, which is now the krill can't enjoy this lovely refuge that used to exist. They have to exist uh, in shallower areas. Shallower areas are well lit. Uh, and now that predation window is really, really intensified. So basically, depending on the strength of the oxygen depletion, we actually might get uh, either a decoupling or an intensification of the coupling of this really, really critical linkage. Of course, remember this is day daytime distributions. Nighttime distributions is a whole different ballgame because krill have these you know, really large vertical migrations. In addition to that, we made a bunch of other predictions based on a bunch of other mechanisms. Um, first of all, hey, when there's less oxygen, fish have less metabolic scope to digest stuff. So, you know, maybe there's a reduction in feeding intensity just because of that. Um, maybe, you know, through time, the, ex the exposure of seasonal low dissolved oxygen, maybe it fundamentally changes the zooplankton community structure. And maybe you don't have as much of that big beefy krill that the herring really like to eat. Uh, and instead, maybe you get more gelatinous stuff. Um, and then there's actually some really interesting work that has shown that uh, uh, krill are not completely, um, you know, they can't outswim necessarily a fish, but they do have some evasive tactics they can do. Uh, and uh, there's some laboratory work that shows that their ability to use those evasive tactics aren't as good when oxygen conditions are low. So maybe that would make them a little bit more vulnerable. So we basically went at this trophic linkage uh, with a wide range of hypotheses and kind of threw the kitchen sink at it when it came to sampling. Um, basically what we did is we took advantage of that, that differences north-south in terms of the intensity and timing of low dissolved oxygen. So we sampled uh, four different sites in two different years over many, many months. So we started in June when we expect oxygen condition, conditions to be pretty good everywhere, and then sampled monthly uh, uh, from June all the way through October. Um, and then for every sample, we did both day and night sampling because we expect the vertical distribution to change during day and night. Well, what do we sample? Uh, everything we possibly could, basically. Uh, we did so much, we had to have two boats, um, two medium-sized boats. So we um, used the UW oceanography vessel, uh, Clifford Barnes, uh, and Julie Keister was sort of the lead on that. She, she did as all the oceanographic monitoring, uh, you know, doing the usual CTT cast uh, and oxygen sampling, um, but it also did all the zooplankton sampling with a multi-net. So we can get really good information on zooplankton contribution. Comp uh, composition and their depth distribution. At the same time, uh, we were uh, hanging out over on the RV Centennial. Um, I realized when I put the slide together, both these boats no longer float. So that's sad. Um, but the RV Centennial, when it used to float, um, uh, we were on board where we did uh, acoustic transects um, and then biological sampling. And then a lot of talking back and forth between the two, two vessels. So real quick, you know, acoustics is just a way to get densities of, of marine life. And May Sato, who I'm sure many of you know, um, did a lot of great work here trying to actually pull out the, the frequency signal so we can say, hey, that little ping there is probably a herring. You know, that's probably a hake. That's probably zooplankton uh, based on the, the data that we collected. So we could get some estimates of density in addition to where are all these different things. And then uh, biological sampling uh, included uh, doing uh, trawl samples, uh, basically going after targeted layers that we saw in the acoustics. And then that also then gave us our biological samples where we could look at our hake and look at our herring, uh, stomach contents to see what they're eating and how much they're eating. We did stable isotopes, we did aging, um, and we also measured for this thing called um, IF, which stands for hypoxable inducible factor, uh, which is a, a a collection of proteins that uh, fish express when they're exposed to low dissolved oxygen that triggers a lot of the metabolic responses to it. So we did that just, just for herring, just to see if they were expressing this during the time periods when hypoxia was, or low dissolved oxygen was, was present. 
quick um, summary of what happened in the oxygen story. Uh, these are just sort of integrated averages of oxygen over the water column once you get below the, the thermocline, so the areas where all the action really was. Um, basically, nat Mother Nature dealt us a really good hand here, basically. Um, in 2012 was what I would call a normal year in that in the two southern areas, you saw the very typical seasonal drawdown of oxygen, um, starting from pretty great down to starting to get bad, but not terrible. And then the two more northerly sites, they started to draw down, but not nearly as much, and in fact, even started to rebound a little bit towards the end. The one thing that was so lucky was that 2013 had a very different seasonal pattern of oxygen drawdown and recovery, which was so important. Um, basically, you started off lower, uh, the drawdown reached its minimum around September, and then rebounded in October in the southern sites. And then once again, uh, the northernly sites were really different. The reason why this is really, really key is the tough part about measuring something that's a seasonal phenomenon is how do you separate the effect of this phenomenon from the regular seasonal pattern? Uh, so fortunately, because the seasonal pattern of, of oxygen drawdown was different between the two years, it gave us a, little bit, a lot more information to tease out sort of the normal seasonal pattern of events from things that are being dictated by the changes in oxygen conditions. So that was lucky. Um, the other thing I really want to emphasize is we never really got down to the really severe oxygen depletion that might cause, uh, for instance, krill to have to go to really change their vertical depth distribution. So these, these oxygen levels are not that, that gnarly from a krill's perspective. OK, um, real quick. May showed really quickly that there was no change in vertical overlap. And they don't need to look at this in any detail other than to say, hey, there's a lot of squiggly lines that go up and down. They don't seem to show much of anything. Yep, that's pretty much what we saw. There was no change in that the overlap between herring or hake and zooplankton, um, even though we looked really hard for it. But despite that, we wanted to go forward and actually try to fit some statistical models to try to estimate, well, what what is the effect of oxygen either on the densities of fish, the densities of krill, the feeding habits, or the feeding intensity? So what we did is we uh, took something similar to a generalized linear mixed effects model. If you've never heard of that, it's basically a fancy linear regression. Um, and in all cases, we, we assume that there are effects of site, there are sites of year, and, if, and effects of dial period on all these response variables. So that, that comes into sort of basically our null model is that these things are always important. And then we would introduce alternative models, which are different combinations of different ways of introducing dissolved oxygen or month as a proxy for season. Uh, the season is basically getting at the normal phenology. And then the way we introduce oxygen is we, we, we spend some time thinking about it and realize, well, we probably just don't want a normal like line that says more oxygen is always better because oxygen is what we call a limiting factor. In other words, as long as there's enough oxygen, adding more oxygen doesn't really matter. You know, so imagine if we were in an auditorium right now in a good best of times, and then the, the, you know, the air conditioning system or heating system gets shut off, like sure enough, oxygen would actually start dropping in that room, but hardly anyone would notice uh, because there was still plenty of air in there, unless you know, I gave like a 14 hour seminar or something like that. Um, so we really want to basically imagine that there's some threshold level of oxygen above which changes don't really matter. So we basically fit what we call a breakpoint model. Uh, breakpoint model means you do two things: is you you, you try to estimate a threshold. Uh, so what's the the point at which you start to see an effect of oxygen? And then once you get below that threshold, what is the effect size? So how quickly do things change? And and they could go up. Uh, or they could go down. So those are the two things that we're going to estimate when we look for the effects of, of oxygen. And then we had two ways of making inference. One was what I call model selection uh, or looking at model weights. Uh, this is just one example looking at herring stomach fullness just as an example. These are all of the alternative models that we fit. Base means it just includes those handful of things that we know are probably important. So where, what site, what year, what yield period, and then adding in different predictors. And then we just say, hey, which model is best supported by the data? A big number means good support, zero means no support. So in this particular one, uh, this particular model where we're 
or uh, dissolved oxygen seems to be having a, a lot of weight. This happened to be something about what, what is, well, basically how, mu how much of the zooplankton consists of large euphausids, the things that we really care about. Um, so big numbers mean there's a lot of support. And then the other thing we did is looked at um, effect sizes. So how big was the effect of oxygen? So taking that same response variable, uh, we can get this distribution of probability distribution of effect sizes. Zero means no effect. This means a decrease. In this case, in herring and stomach fullness, big values mean an increase. This is our confidence interval. Confidence interval doesn't include zero, which suggests, hey, it looks like there's an effect of, of oxygen. So if you're at two milligrams per liter, it looks like you're going to get maybe on average about one third the stomach fullness. So those are two ways of making inference. I'm not going to go through <laughs> every response variable and every way we looked at it because that would be horrendous. Um, so I'm just going to give a stylized summary of what, what we saw. On the fish side of things, um, absolutely no change in what they're eating at all. No change in the vertical, vertical distribution. I already talked about that. And no change in the prey overlap. So uh, herring or hake and krill, they, they were basically mushed on top of each other the same. Um, but we did see some changes in the feeding rate. I just showed that one for herring. Um, and then we saw changes in density that we did not expect to see. And in particular, if anything, it looked like herring became more abundant as the oxygen conditions deteriorated in those, in those places. That wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, these herring did not read the literature that said that they were supposed to be very, very sensitive to these levels of oxygen. Even stranger is we saw a negative effect of hake, despite the fact that hake live in some really, really low oxygen conditions water all the time. Um, if you've ever seen a hake, they're just a tough, tough looking fish um, and really, really tolerant. Uh, so that made no sense to us. And then over on the, the zooplankton side, again, no change in vertical distribution, no change in predator overlap. Um, but we did see a change in density, but it was went down. We actually saw lower densities of zooplankton, most of which was krill, as oxygen conditions got worse and worse. That wasn't supposed to happen. So what is going on? What are sort of the possible explanations and what lessons that I take from this? Uh, the first is, hey, this is a system where oxygen conditions get bad all the time. Uh, and a physiologist would be quick to point out that organisms have a wide range of things that they can uh, change on the fly. In other words, they're very plastic to deal with changing oxygen conditions. So they can change their gill surface area, they can change their hematocrit volume, they can change their baseline metabolism. You know, all those things have costs, uh, but allow things to still cope. Um, so I think the, the ability to acclimate particularly when oxygen conditions are just sort of gradually getting worse, are probably really important in this, in this system. The next thing is just the, the high dimensionality of environmental conditions. You know, I came into this thinking like, hey, this is a, this is a project about oxygen. But May Sato um, really pointed out, well, it should be a question about both temperature and oxygen, because most of the areas in the canal that have the worst oxygen conditions also are coldest. And that combination of being cold and having low oxygen means like maybe you can tolerate that low oxygen because your metabolism is so low. So we kind of went into this a little bit naively by trying to think of, we would just look at one thing when we should have been looking at both things. But finally, it really, really hammered home to me the because, because the outcome in situ, in other words, in the field, when we threw this kitchen sink approach at monitoring these predictions, and these predictions came, I mean, they weren't crazy. <laughs> they came from you know, really well understood theory, really well documented experimental evidence, uh, evidence in other systems. We convinced a very skeptical pattern of reviewers that we would see a signal, uh, and yet we didn't see them. And in fact, we often saw the opposite responses, which I just think reinforces this idea. Again, we're making forecasts a lot. You know, our proposal essentially was a, pro a forecast of what would happen. Um, and it really just reinforced the, the value of trying to find an opportunity to evaluate the, the predictions for, or some forecasts uh, in situ as a way of integrating sort of experimental knowledge about physiological tolerances and behavioral responses 
uh, and then trying to scale that up to the system. Uh, so, so finding those opportunities to sort of test those is gonna advance our ability to make forecasts about ecological futures. Okay, my final story is going to switch gears. I'm going to move out of Hood Canal, and I'm going to venture into a, a world that is you know, pretty topical right now, and that is um, one dimension of ecological forecasting in the oceans has to do with species distribution shifts. And we all know that species are moving a lot right now, um, and they're moving all over the place. Um, they're, they're changing their depths, they're, they're moving towards the poles, sometimes they're moving in the wrong directions. Um, and a big focus of that work has been focused on temperature as a driving force in distributional shifts. And for sure, that is a really, really critical part of the story of species distributional shifts. Also, species distributional shifts are a huge deal in terms of governance of, of fisheries. It's a huge deal ecologically where you've got um, novel species coming in, um, in in the US and New England, New England for instance, uh, the lobster uh, people are freaking out because uh, these black sea bass are moving in from the south and they're gobbling up baby lobsters. Uh, so it's a big deal that species are, are moving around and this is an area where you know, we need to have some forecasts of what the future is going to look like so we can start planning for the, what the future is going to hold. Oxygen has received relatively less attention in the space of species distribution shifts and ecological forecasts. You know, uh, folks like Will, of course, have been doing you know, great stuff on, on oxygen in terms of productivity and growth, um, uh, but, but there's a little bit less work on distributional shifts. So we wanted to try to say, hey, can we advance statistical species distributional models uh, by including oxygen in a thoughtful way? And in particular, um, what we wanted to do was bridge this sometimes rancorous divide between physiology and, and ecology. And it basically stems from ecology wanting to make kind of quick assumptions about physiology because we have to uh, in order to make our lives uh, tractable. Uh, where of course physiologists are really embedded in, in the nuance of how organisms respond to things. It's led to a lot of clashes in the literature. Um, but so we wanted to say, hey, can we just make some simple steps to bridge, bridge that, that divide? Um, so one way you might be able to bridge that divide is simply by doing species distribution modeling using these breakpoint models that I just talked about in that last vignette. Uh, that sort of acknowledges that, that oxygen is a limiting factor and we expect it to behave in a threshold way. More interesting, at least to me, was actually um, going into the, the work that um, Curtis Deutsch has been doing uh, in collaboration with Hans Portner and a bunch of other people um, of looking at both temperature and oxygen as a joint quantity in this thing called the metabolic index and ask whether or not that can do a good job, better job of enhancing our ability to forecast distributional shifts, again, in a very physiologically informed way that gets up the underlying mechanisms really well. That's what we wanted to do. Uh, the star of our show is going to be this, this fella. Um, unlike the adorably cute Pacific herring, uh, we have the somewhat dopey looking uh, sable fish. Um, even though they're a little bit dopey looking, they're pretty important fish for the fisheries in US, Canada, uh, Alaska. Um, I'm sure many of you have maybe had sable fish uh, in restaurants and whatnot. Um, the other reason we pick sable fish is that they live at a depth where they're exposed to pretty low oxygen. So they, they hang out at pretty deep depths. And then, uh, and then frankly, it was the only ground fish species uh, that we could find that someone had done some experimental work to look at the physiological tolerance uh, of, um, uh, among all the different things. So we're like, okay, we'll do that one since at least there's one lab study. So I wanna talk about this metabolic index real quick because I think it's really cool work that, um, uh, that these folks have done. So I'm just going to basically describe uh, what, what, it, what it's trying to do. Um, basically, it starts uh, with this graph that basically says you can look at an organism and look at um, its oxygen demand as a function of temperature. And all these graphs, they have to use inverse temperature. And just because of the equation that is the right equation to use, you have to use inverse temperature. So to make your life easier, I just put hot over here and cold over there. Oh, there it is. Where's my finger? There it is. Uh, uh, and that, just so you can sort of reference yourself. So these are colder temperatures, warmer temperatures. So as you get warmer, uh, the oxygen demand of an organism goes up, right? 
Well, we can think of then about, let's imagine a particular uh, uh, oxygen condition. So we can look at what is the, how does supply of oxygen scale with temperature at a given uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen. Um, it's going, also going to go up with temperature, but not nearly as steeply as demand does. So right here is a magical intercept that basically says anything below here says that the demand is outstripping supply. So an organism really can't live over here for any extended period of time uh, because they, at least they can't live aerobically. Uh, they're gonna have to go anaerobic in order to pull it off. See Catherine doing this. I don't know if she's saying hello or stop. Oh, she went away. Um, it's just that you have five about five minutes. Great, so. thank you. Uh, over here uh, means there's plenty of oxygen um, or at least there's enough oxygen to live. As you increase uh, the PO2, that point of intersection moves. So you can actually just uh, rearrange some equations and say, hey, how does this, uh, this point of intersection vary um, uh, as a function of temperature? And that gets you this line right here. So this is the magic line above this line. Uh, the, the PO2 and the temperature is such that the, the supply exceeds demand and below here it is less than this. So we're gonna ask whether or not this metabolic index, this ratio of supply and demand does a good job of, of forecasting or predicting species distributions. Oops, keep doing that. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to skip all this for a sake of time, uh, but we came up with a cool way of estimating metabolic index for our sablefish, but our approach was similar before. We're going to fit some geostatistical models to survey catch rate. What they do is they capture the latent spatial processes, in other words, the unobserved spatial processes, and basically say, hey, there is an effect of space, and we're going to account for that. We're going to account for differences in year. We're going to account for the effect of depth. And then, like before, add in different combinations of things. Gosh. Darn it, there we go, of um, uh, PO2, temperature, metabolic index, using both a breakpoint and not a breakpoint, and then rely on model selection to say, hey, which is best supported by the data? What we found is the breakpoint models are awesome. So they really, really outperformed all of the other uh, uh, possible models. So what this is, is what we call an AIC table. This is our weight, uh, uh, column, this, this column here tells you degree of support. We want this number to be as low as possible. Uh, so the best model right here, zero, was a model that just had a breakpoint model for PO2. Um, falling in just behind it is adding in temperature. It helps a little bit, but not that much. Um, and then surprisingly, uh, my favorite index uh, didn't do very well at all. Uh, this difference in model support is pretty substantial, um, it, it, where many people would say you could pretty much discount this model. Um, so two things that jumped out, breakpoint models did way better than their non-breakpoint counterparts, but very surprisingly, the metabolic index kind of fell flat on its face, which was a surprise. So let's look at a couple things. What was this model telling us about temperature and then why did metabolic index not work in this particular case? So the best fitting model is predicting pretty substantial effects of oxygen. So these are just the fitted effects. Um, uh, and just for a sense of scale, um, this is the estimated effect of bottom depth on sablefish density in the trawl survey catch rate. So, pretty big effect of depth as we expected. The effect of uh, oxygen is not as large, um, but it's still pretty substantial. So in other words, the, the, the threshold effect of oxygen that was estimated turned out to be about 0.05 atmospheres. That's pretty darn low, um, but it's right in line with a lot of the lab studies. Um, but then it does say that at the lowest observed oxygen, we would expect sablefish density to be reduced to about one third of what it would have been in the absence of oxygen. Uh, so, uh, you know, an ecologically significant effect size. So that was cool. Now let's get back at why didn't the metabolic index do a better job? And to do this, I need to do here, pull up a new graph. So what I've plotted here is all the survey data uh, with depth on this axis and then temperature, PO2, and then the estimated, estimated metabolic index. The color of the point is what happened to be the catch rate of sable fish in the survey, where gray meant they were absent. What was going on here was really interesting. So at, at, at these really deep depths, temperature gets colder and colder and colder. That makes sense. 
Um, but PO2 was measured was actually getting slightly larger than, than what it was um, at, the, at the lowest point. So potentially what was happening was the trawl survey was going below the oxygen minimum zone. So we're getting a slight increase in temperature or in, in pre partial pressure of oxygen. And as a result, the metabolic index is actually going up quite a bit at depth. So the model can't understand why there aren't more sablefish hanging out at 1,250 meters since the metabolic index conditions are getting a lot better. So in other words, this was sort of bad luck for the poor metabolic index um, uh, because where sablefish just happened to reside was a place where things were kind of funny going on. In fact, when I refit the model by just ignoring all the data deeper than 800 meters, the metabolic index was the best performing model. In other words, it did do a really good job of figuring out where sablefish were. Okay, so lesson learned of this is that, hey, um, just pausing a moment before plunging into a, a species distribution statistical model and just think a little bit about the underlying physiology really made us make a couple of big steps. Um, I, I really think there's still value, a lot of value in these physiological informed indices like the metabolic index. And in fact, we're going to keep looking at them. Um, and then uh, sablefish is probably among the most robust species when it comes to oxygen sensitivity in the entire groundfish community. So the fact that we saw these effect sizes uh, made me sort of really ponder, well, what about all the other critters out there uh, that are uh, less robust? And then finally, just to tie it all together, um, let's bring this back to thinking about ecological forecasting and dissolved oxygen. Um, we need to be playing in this space. I think we have an imperative to do it. Um, I think I'm an optimist about our ability to do ecological forecasts, but I think what this body of work has sort of reinforced uh, an appropriate degree of humility in uh, our field's ability to do forecasts. And looking back in all those cases, I. And all, I, I came into each of those studies really anchoring on an idea, and that anchoring effect really made me blind to other things. And I, and I think that's something as a field that we all do. Um, uh, so I think we should continue to do our forecasts, um, but always just try to be aware of the assumptions that we don't even know that we're making, uh, or um, just really strong anchoring <laughs> ideas that are really making us not maybe not see the full picture. So with that, real quick, um, lots of great people and amazing collaborators. I'm not going to name them all, uh, but they're all fantastic. Um, and then real quickly, thanks for all the people that helped me support that. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Essington. Um, we have a question from the chat. Uh, Elias, if you want to ask your question. Uh, should I read the question? I can read it. No, no, no. Uh, I'm going to um, let okay. Elias. Yeah, actually, I, I asked the question a little bit earlier than uh, I, I was supposed to because kind of uh, was answered already. But my question was, is there any evidence that raising water temperature due to climate change are contributing to these low oxygen levels? Yeah, that's a, it's a big part of the mechanism of why globally um, we're getting more and more depletion. Um, and it's why it's got to be part of the conversation about ecological forecasts. Is there, is there a correlation between this uh, oxygen level and the sanality uh, level in the water? Um, I mean, there is some, the, hopefully an oceanographer can help me out. It's not nearly as strong as no. the temperature effect. Gabriel is, is helping me out here. I'm phoning a friend. <laughs> so we can ignore salinity <laughs> and uh, yeah, temperature is a big, uh, big issue. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Danielle Montgomery. So Danielle, if you want to ask your question. Uh, thanks for the talk, it was really interesting. Um, I'm in the zoology department, so I'm a physiologist. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about um, what could physiologists be doing better in terms of experimental work to inform the sorts of predictions you're trying to make for ecosystem approaches? Yeah, that's a, it's a, a great, great question. Um, uh, I, I think, and I, I don't actually know whether I should even say these are physiologists doing these studies, but um, you know, a lot of the, the experimental work looking at oxygen sensitivity is also, you know, take a fish in, in that's perfectly happy and then slam dunk it in some terrible conditions and see what happens um, as opposed, you know, which 
tells us something about what happens when you suddenly and acutely have responded to uh, uh, oxygen, but uh, you're getting more at you know, allowing fish to acclimate and knowing the acclimation potential. Um, that's one key thing. Um, I think actually getting into local adaptation um, and that's, that's one thing I would love to do in, in Hook Canal is partner with someone who has considerable more skills than I do and ask, uh, you know, are the fish in Southern Hook Canal, are they physiologically just more capable, uh, you know, like a car common garden experiment, something like that. So uh, I think those looking at acclimation and adaptation um, uh, would be great. And then I think finally is um, uh, doing experiments over a wide range of, uh, of there's, there's basically this tension, you know, if, if I'm gonna do an experiment, I wanna see a result because <laughs> I wanna publish it. Um, uh, so uh, what that might mean is I might use a warmer temperature uh, than, than what is relevant for what where oxygen is actually being depleted. So having combinations of PO2 and, and, and temperature that match what is out there in the real world is gonna be really helpful for us. There is a question from William. Mm. Thanks, Tim. Very interesting talk, uh, as always. Uh, so I have uh, a uh, comment and uh, a question. Uh, so the, uh, one of our, our, our postdoc, um, Taylor Clark, has been developing a, a, a versions of the uh, metabolic index that we call it a good aerobic growth index, uh, yeah. which that does not need the physiological experimental data. So it would be yeah. interesting for, I think, for us to, to, to apply that and see uh, and test it uh, with your data set. I think it would be interesting. We have been comparing the, the indices. Uh, so it sounds like uh, to us, uh, it would be a good opportunity for us to, to, to have a look at that. Uh, and I think it's uh, about uh, whether you have applied the metabolic index to look at the species uh, in your first part of the talk and see whether that would actually also um, tell you something uh, or inform you about why some of the species are increasing some of some of it are not maybe it's because of the the relative performances um, uh, with uh, temperature changes and oxygen changes that are different between the different species uh, after you account for the kind of physiological sensitivity of the species right yeah yeah so um, one, yeah, I'd love to, yeah, and I'm very aware of the, the aerobic index, and uh, we became aware of it when we were like three quarters of the way through the paper, so <laughs> we're like, ah, <laughs> let's just avert our eyes for now <laughs> and, and finish this piece up, uh, but yeah, I'd love to love to chat more about that. Um, basically, where, where we're going now is, um, uh, one, we want to see whether or not we can estimate parameters of the metabolic index from the distributions themselves. So that's, that's work that's sort of ongoing uh, in sort of a Bayesian framework. So uh, the experimental work gives us a prior, and then we can say, hey, what, what signal can we extract out? Um, and then ultimately, what we want to do is we got funding um, from Washington Sea Grant. Um, uh, we're going to look basically all the way from California through Alaska, including British Columbia, um, and basically by looking at all those regions, ask, well, what is the role of oxygen and temperature and species distributional shifts through the lens of looking at overlap of species that are targeted by fisheries? Um, uh, so basically, could we get an issue where species that are currently easy to avoid might be harder to avoid in the future, um, but via a lot of species distribution modeling? And, and also asking if we simultaneously try to estimate these effects over all these different ranges, can we get more robust? Effects that so that's kind of where we're going in the, in this place, uh, partnering with folks at DFO, um, Robin Forrest and Sean Anderson in particular. Um, I have a question, and then it would be a Rashid. Uh, I have a, a simple statistic questions. Um, so we know that the species distribution model rests on the Hutchinson niche concept, and you you train your data on survey data, which doesn't fully cover the distribution of the species. So I'm wondering if your AKK result are just a reflection of the partial gradient, mm -hmm. the environmental gradient that you're sampling, and therefore you might have a truncation of the niche and therefore a biased model, since you don't cover the full distribution and therefore the full physiological response of the species. Yeah, no, I think yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, when we were, we were using a, a smaller chunk of the California current at one point and actually getting really different results. So, uh, it, it, and we ended up 
having to shift and use the whole thing. Um, uh, yeah, having then I, I fully expect once we expand the geographic range even more, we're going to get different results still. I 100% think that's an expectation. Thank you. Uh, Rashid, and I think you will be the last question, Rashid. Yeah, Tim, I, I, I like the way you, you stress the humility part of uh, for predictions, you know. And uh, it's good to highlight that it, it's so important. Uh, there's some of us, uh, some economists who say that economists are those who make predictions. And when they make them, they are wrong 80% of the time, you know. So they, they used to, they use 80% of their time to predict, make predictions, you know, that come out wrong. And then they, 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 they use the rest of their time to explain why. <laughs> it is wrong and and that process is important yeah. right that's how we improve that's why you went ahead to continue even though you know you have to be to be so so that's that's a good point but that means that doesn't mean we shouldn't predict mm -hmm. just be aware right and learn from it which is beautiful now you, you had this uh, seasonal results which I, I i like right oxygen following is this a general result so it's just for your case study i i just felt that that alone is very useful right mm. Yeah, good. Yeah, I think it, the the seasonality piece is super common. Um, mm. uh, you know, obviously, you even we kind of ignored it a little bit uh, in this presentation on the on the shelf because you know you get seasonal upwelling and uh, intrusion of low dissolved oxygen mm. which has probably pretty profound effects. It doesn't really affect stable fish too much because they're not hanging out on the shelf. But I think once we get into uh, the the shallower species, we're gonna we're certainly gonna see that. Um, but you know, a lot of you know, estuaries, seasonal hypoxia is the, the standard, and that's just very, very typical. So it's a pretty generalized thing. Whenever you get kind of enclosed water, you're going to see that that type of thing. Wonderful. That's, that's good. So there we're more talking with you, right? I mean, if that is uh, general, we could actually build some economic stuff into this, and that would be cool, uh, team. So that'd be fun. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks, team, for a really, really good talk to get our seminar series started. I think this is wonderful. Uh, so thank you very much uh, um, for that. Uh